this session will be, uh, for many of you, if you are consider yourself expert level knowledge with SQL Server, it will probably be a review. This is actually, this session is intended for those of us who work with SQL Server a lot, but we don't work with it very, very deeply. We don't spend a lot of time deep inside of SQL Server. And so, one of the things I learned in my career is that as a professional in the particular specialty that we have chosen, there are certain models that we can follow in terms of the skill sets that we should emulate. And so uh, I was actually one of the founders of PASS uh, back, way back in 1999, and at that time I ran the database management team for a big uh, consulting and auditing company called Deloitte. And we spent a lot of money trying to figure out what were the highest performing teams in the world. And for those of you who are interested in sports, you might be interested to learn that some of the management consultants consider the highest performing teams in the business, in the world, typically to be the pit crews for racing car teams. Anyone watch racing at all? Right? You know, you, you look at these pit crews and there's a person who just does like one or two tires, right? There's a person who just does the gas, you know, the fuel for the vehicle and things like that. Very specialized skills, but there's not a person on that team even if all you do is change tires, there's not a person on that team who doesn't know everything there is to know about an internal combustion engine, right? You're not gonna hire a person like that to be on your racing car team if they don't know what the pistons do, what the fuel injectors do, and what the uh, spark plugs do, and so forth. And there's an analogy for us, because we are IT professionals. But many, many times I talk to people who have no idea what the relational engine that they are a team member on does. They don't understand it. They don't know why it works the way it does. And so that's kind of the intention of what this session is about. I have two blogs, kevinekline.com, that's my professional technology blog, and then 4itpros.com is also a blog for those of you who are trying to develop and cultivate your soft skills, leadership skills, management skills, things like that. One of the things I've found is that many of us get promoted higher up in our organization because we're the best technologist on our team, we're the best developer, we're the best DBA, and we get promoted, and then everything that made us successful in our career up through that point no longer matters. Uh, isn't that a smart way to promote? Um, so the good news there, too, is that those skills can also be learned. Uh, I work for a company called SQL Century. We make a variety of different tools, monitoring and management tools for SQL Server. One of our most popular tools is a free query tuning tool called Plan Explorer. And it is and always will be free. Uh, it's so free, we don't even ask for your email address. So just download it, 60,000 users, love it. And uh, there's a lot of other things here. If you want to take a picture or save it for later, send me an email to take advantage of any of these options. One other thing, too, we do have a pro version of PE Pro. So I, uh, I got permission to extend a special discount. Uh, this is the discount you would normally get if you bought 10 or more licenses for the product. So if you're interested in the pro version, just drop me a note. But if you're not, get the free version. It's, it's exceptional really, really is a good tool. And in fact, if you read a lot of the blogs, most of the people who do blogging about SQL Server and they write about query plans, execution plans, they're going to be writing about it using images taken from our tool rather than Management Studio. It's, it's much, much better than SQL Server Management Studio. So our agenda, uh, this was uh, actually loosely based for the first time on uh, a, a book I really liked by a friend of mine named Christian, um, uh, Christian Bolton in, in the UK. And so we're going we're gonna to do, you can probably tell I wrote this originally for Amsterdam, based on our first topic there. Um, we're going to drop some acid early. We're going to go through the, the internals of the SQL Server engine uh, from two standpoints. First, as a read operation, as a select statement. And then we're going to go through it a second time as a write operation. Each time we're going to look at the different elements of the engine, but we're not going to go super deep. If you have questions, we can talk about that, or I can point you to some other resources if there's something that you really, really want to know about. Um, so everybody ready to drop some acid? Sound, sound good? First thing in the morning? Um, but we're not talking about lysergic acid, right? We're not talking about hydrochloric acid. We're talking about this. One of the major factors in any 
relational database system that governs the way it is architected, it is designed, is this acronym, the ACID property of transactions. This was the big innovation for relational database systems. When relational database systems came out, the, the preceding kind of uh, uh, most popular method for managing data was either uh, what they called a hierarchical or a network structure, or something like flat files with COBOL and Fortran. That's actually how I got my first professional job was for NASA. I was a really good Fortran programmer. Anyone here use Fortran? And you don't even have gray hair. How is that possible? Uh, I don't have hair. I have an excuse. Um, yeah, so different ways of doing it. So there was an innovative group of people who said, you know what? The way we're doing things now introduces a lot of problems. We, uh, for example, if I delete a sales record, I might have lots of sales detail records left behind. So we have to make sure that we introduce some, some methods into the way we set up our system so that those kinds of things don't happen. In particular, we want to protect money. Whenever it comes to money, people tend to get a little bit defensive if you lose track of it. You know, they don't like that very much. So what does, for those of you who've taken a class on it and studied, what does A stand for in ACID? Mm, not many people have taken a class on it. Yes. Atomic. Atomic, yes. So it means relational databases are nuclear powered, right? Big mushroom cloud where, okay, no, that joke failed. Um, think about chemistry, okay? In chemistry, we have compounds, like perhaps a cup of coffee. And then within compounds, we have molecules, like the water molecules, the lacto uh, lactose molecules from the milk or the cream that were, you know, the sugar molecules, caffeine molecules. And then below that, we have the atoms that compose those different molecules. We have, oh, let's say carbon and, uh, you know, oxygen hydrogen. And if we split those any further in a chemical sense, it loses all of its characteristics of what make it unique, right? It's no longer carbon if we break it any smaller than that. It's no, more, no, no longer hydrogen. So the corollary here for us in transactions is they are atomic. They are just themselves. They have only the properties of themselves. They're not a compound. They don't do multiple things. They're not a molecule. They don't do, you can't also do an insert and an update at the same time using the exact same logic, you have to do one individual thing, okay? What about the C? What is the C in that acronym? I heard it. Consistent, consistent right. So what's a consistent transaction? Come on now, you guys are just, you're just testing me, aren't you? It's the same every time, right? So if I'm gonna withdraw $100 from an account, it has to be $100, it can't be 98, can't be, you know, it can't do things a little bit inconsistently. How about I? Isolation, right? It has to be isolated. We cannot affect other transactions, other users at the same time. If we are, we're, we're gonna have data anomalies of different sorts. Each one of these, actually in the order that we're listing, creates characteristics inside of the database system of increasing overhead, okay? So atomicity is the least overhead inducing of these. Then we go to consistency. That produces a little bit more overhead because we have to have uh, things inside of the relational database that will control consistency. It's called locking. We have to have a locking engine, right? And the locking engine also applies to isolation. So for those of you who feel like whenever I use the no lock hint, I'm actually going faster, there may be situations where you go faster, but you're also disabling certain characteristics that are necessary, considered necessary for a good relational system. How about D? What does D mean? Durability. Durability, thank you, very good. A transaction must either be fully committed or fully undone. We can't do it halfway. If a lightning bolt strikes our server while we're doing a big insert, you know, we're doing a big set of cash deposits, those either have to go all the way in or not in at all. How many of us have actually restarted a SQL server and watched in Management Studio as it, as it starts to send all those messages across the screen? You know, for each database, it'll say, you know, starting such database. What does it, what does it then say at that point? 
It'll say things like five rows rolled forward, three, roll, uh, three records rolled back, then it'll go to the next database. And seven ro records rolled forward, three, you know. And it, it's actually applying all of those durability aspects of the transactions. And that whole infrastructure is what we call a transaction log. And we also call it an archive, a redo log on Oracle. So lots of different, lots of different things inside of the uh, relational engine are required for the ACID properties of transactions. In fact, if we decide we don't need this, we can have a really, really fast database. Anybody use MySQL? A couple of you. You look kind of scared, like <laughs> these SQL people will give me a beat down here. Um, well, in the early days, one of the reasons it grew in popularity so much was because you didn't have to do any of this. Yeah, you can have really, really fast transactions when you don't do any of the ACID properties because I don't have any of that overhead. Of course, if uh, anything happens that you haven't programmed for, then you could lose data or have inconsistent data or incorrect data. And that's also one of the things that's really popular about NoSQL databases, like uh, Cassandra or uh, MongoDB or Hadoop or things like that, well, HBase, things like that, is that they do not guarantee these sorts of things. Facebook uses something called um, eventual consistency, right? Does that sound good if you're doing a bank transaction? Eh, it'll eventually get updated sometime tomorrow, next week, something like that. See, Facebook doesn't care how quickly our pictures of our little cute kitty get updated, right? People have a very different threshold for how much they care when it's not related to money. But when it's related to money, we care a lot, right? So those NoSQL systems that churn through enormous amounts of data and those big data scenarios, they really weren't intended to be monetary systems, right? Now, another reason we have a, a lot of the different characteristics inside of SQL Server, the different attributes and uh, you know, different parts of the relational engine is because we want it to be faster, okay? That's simple enough. Part of the way we do that is by maximizing hardware. Anyone know when relational databases were first cooked up? Just a, how about a decade? Anyone? 70s. 70s, thank you. I'm gonna have to give him a copy of my, my book, Sequel in a Nutshell, unless, unless you guys wanna step up here, step it up a little bit in the rest of the presentation. Um, so, yeah, the 70s, right? And what was the primary input-output system in the 70s? It was actually tape back then. Um, and then hard disks started to come on pretty strongly in the 70s. At the end of the 70s, the early 80s, um, you know, I remember I bought my first hard disk, you know, it was a 10 megabyte hard disk and it was about the size of a microwave oven is today, you know? Um, yeah, so all kinds of stuff, and I'll explain as we go through, all kinds of stuff is designed in there to take advantage and maximize hardware. Part of the problem with that is that hardware has a certain paradigm that pass away with time. So there's something new you may have heard of called Hecaton. And that's built on entirely new ideas of what hardware is and can do for us, rather than the older disk-based subsystems. And then finally, the other reason that there are a lot of architectural choices inside a SQL Server is basically because Oracle does it. So <laughs> that's always a big motivator for Microsoft. If the competition does it, then we need to do it too. All right. So. Now, when I first wrote this uh, presentation way back years ago, um, nobody knew who this guy was. It really surprised me. Did you guys get uh, the Big Bang Theory here? Yeah. Woohoo! Sheldon Cooper, right? Um, so he's going to be our tour guide. And what I thought I would do was, this is kind of a dry topic. It's not, you know, it's not terribly engaging. So rather than just throw out facts, I thought I'd try and make it a little bit more like a story. And so what um, Sheldon is going to do is he's our tour guide, and he's going to take us through sort of a map, if you will, uh, imagine maybe he's a bicycle courier and he's carrying a message or uh, something like that. So he has to get a message through. And um, this is the map that he has to navigate. This is the internal architectural structure of SQL Server. All right, any questions? We're done, right? No, uh, just kidding. So like I told you in the beginning, we're going to start with Sheldon and he's going to do a read operation, okay? So imagine you're sitting at your console. It could be with Management Studio. It could be on a website. It could be with a client server system. The results of what happens behind the scenes are the same consistently throughout. Any of those kinds of uh, ways of interfacing with SQL Server will behave the same way. 
So let's say, for example, he is going to book a trip to a conference. And so he goes to his favorite travel website, and you know, there's the box that says, where do you want to fly from and where do you want to fly to? Okay. So it's going to do a lookup to make sure that the code that he types in is a real city. It's going to do a select statement to see if that exists in the table that has all the airport codes. What it will do is it will take that query and it will wrap it up in something called a tabular data stream packet. Okay. This was uh, something invented by Sybase way back in the day and still used by Sybase and by Microsoft SQL Server today. That TDS packet is then going to be picked up by the SQL network interface, the SNI. Okay. And it will use one of, the, excuse me, one of the various protocols that have been specified to carry that message to the SQL Server. So what would a protocol be? What's an example of a common protocol? TCP IP, biggest one on the block, right? What are, what are some of the other ones? Mm. Name pipes would be another. I had one person once say ISDN. I was like, I don't even, what is ISDN? Um, yeah, there are some other ones, VDI, shared memory. Some of the older ones, name pipes is probably one of the uh, longer standing ones. There used to be SPX, IPX, if you used Novell and Banyan Vines, all kinds of old ones like that. So basically, let's say it's TCP IP. It's, it's got a TDS packet that it then kind of stuffs into a TCP IP envelope, and it mails across the wire to the SQL Server. SQL Server, by default, will catch it on port 1433, uh, the TCP IP port, and SQL Server will then pick it up at the command parser. What's a parser do? What, do, what does it mean to parse something? Yeah, it be, I think the word parse in English means to cut up, right? So it cuts it up into its language elements. So if instead of typing S-E-L-E-C-T, he had typed S-E-E-L-C-T, you know, he transposed two of the letters, it would say, I don't know what this word is. I don't understand it. So it looks at it grammatically and checks the syntax for it. So it says, ah, select. I know what this is. This is a SQL language event. That means I can go forward with it. If, if it was S-E-E-L-C-T, it'd say, I, I don't know what this is. I'm going to throw an error and throw it back to you. So then SQL Server begins to try to do what we said earlier. It's going to try and maximize the hardware. And to use memory is about, it's no less than 16 times faster, and it's probably as much as 300 times faster to use memory than to actually have to resolve this by going to the I.O. subsystem. So SQL Server says, have I done this select statement before any time recently? If I have done this select statement or something very, very close to it, then I can reuse the execution plan that I've already created. I don't have to make a new one myself. So it's going to check in the buffer pool. Now, I'm sorry, the buffer pool is all of the memory that SQL Server has access to. There are two main areas you can see in the box there. There's the data cache for data, tables, things like that temp tables. Then there's the plan cache. The plan cache is used for execution plans, ad hoc, SQL, stored procedures, triggers, things like that. Are those the only caches that SQL Server has? No, no, not at all, not by a long shot. Those are the two biggest ones, but there's probably at least a half a dozen other ones. There's access cache, there's uh, sort cache, there's hash buckets, there's all kinds of things that SQL Server puts into memory. And if you want to see what all of those are, you can use the DMV called DMOS Memory Clerks, and you can see what they all are and how much is being used for them. Just an interesting difference, too, between Oracle and SQL Server. In Oracle, you can personally adjust every cache. There's a knob for each one. In SQL Server, there's only a knob for the total amount of memory that SQL Server gets. You know, you can say, what's the minimum and what's the maximum? Those are about, that's about it. There's a few more that they've added in, in actual recent releases as well. So imagine again, he's going, he's pedaling on his bike, and the, the protocol layer is kind of like a little kiosk. It's a tiny, small little building. He can just shoot right by it, go straight to the command parser. But the query optimizer, I've got that kind of in a three-dimensional box, the query optimizer is like a 72-story building. And we want to be very careful about delivering messages there, right? Because we might have to go to the very top of that building. So we want to avoid going there if we can. 
So after we check to see if it's in the plan cache, if it is, we reuse it. And sometimes we can reuse improperly. So you'll see sessions that are about things like parameter sniffing or how to optimize plan reuse, different names like that. That's because you can do things in the way you code that will cause plans to be reused improperly or to be not reused enough. And so there's a lot of opportunities to do a better job there with how you manage your plan cache. Then, assuming it's not in the plan cache, well, we do have to go visit that big high rise over there. So what SQL Server does is it creates a query tree and it hands that over to the optimizer. Now the optimizer is gonna go through a, uh, it's technically it's like a four step process, but they begin at pre-optimization and then they go to phase one and phase uh, two. So it's four steps, but it only gets up to number two. I'm not sure I understand all of that. An interesting thing about the way SQL Server is gonna choose to optimize this query plan too, is it does not look for the best plan. It does not look for the best execution plan. It looks for the optimal execution plan. What's the difference between best and optimal? What's the difference? The cost of calculating, yeah, that's definitely part of it. The big difference is time. To get the best plan, it might take 30 seconds for the optimizer to evaluate the cost of every option. But to get the optimal plan, Microsoft is kind of a hard rule that says, whatever is best that you have found in half a second, choose that. So that's the default behavior of SQL Server. You can adjust it, there's a trace flag to, to tinker with those settings, but by default, it's gonna pick the optimal plan, whatever is best it can find in about a half a second or so. And uh, so it goes through this multi-step process. The first is what uh, produces what's called a trivial plan. This is uh, pre-optimization. So that might be if you say select get date. I mean, I'm not even getting a value from a table, right? It's just a system variable. Select from get date. Trivial plans, it doesn't really even cache. It just clears them out immediately. It doesn't put those up into the cache. The next phase is what we call phase zero. And it only, it looks at three patterns. If you do a select from a single table, if you do a select from a couple columns, and it can have a few other things like a very, very simple uh, join. So that's phase zero. And that produces what are called um, transaction processing plans. The plan level after that, phase one, it produces something called quick plans. And that's where it starts to, now it's starting to make a lot of choices. I see there's a couple joins, there's a where clause that's got a function call. And now I can start to look at multiple indexes, maybe I want to use this index or not that one. And it also begins to apply at that phase heuristics. So not only is it making choices about what plans I can choose, it's also making choices to prune off parts, potential parts of the execution plan analysis. And so it's cutting those options off and it won't go all the way down that path and it won't go all the way down this path. It's gonna say, I'm not gonna to try to do a hash merge or a hash join. I know absolutely that I'm not gonna do it. And then finally is the complex queries. That's phase, it goes all the way to phase two, which is when we have parallelism, we have all kinds of sorting, we have all kinds of uh, things happening at that stage. If it goes all the way to that full plan, and so um, that's where SQL Server is sending Sheldon all the way up to the 70, uh, 72nd floor of that building, right? He's had to spend a lot of time there. And I'll explain about how SQL Server handles those in the plan cache as well in just a moment. So now it's got, it's got it all figured out. It's just a logical plan at this point. It's not physical. It's not actually pulling data from the desk, disk or the IO subsystem, but it knows what it wants to do. It then takes and hands off a query plan, sometimes called a query fingerprint as well. It's actually not human readable. If you were to look at it in a debugger, it's a hash. It's 126th the size of the written text to read it. Um, and it hands it over to the query executor or executor, however you like to pronounce that. Both of those remind me of death for some reason. <laughs> an executor is the person who cuts off your head with a great big battle ax, and then an executor is the person who takes care of your will after you've died. So one way or the other, it has a morbid connotation for me. But uh, so then SQL Server uses a little internal OLADB mechanism where it hands it off from the relational engine, that's the query processor up at the top, that's all logical, and it hands it off to the storage engine. 
which is all the physical work that SQL Server has to do to actually give Sheldon the answers to his question. The first element that it hits in the, in the storage engine is the access methods. And so if you look at a query execution plan, and I hope you have looked at execution plans, you'll see that there are both the logical operations, like, I don't know, you know, an inner join or something like that. And then there's the physical operations, where it says it's a anti-join or left semi-anti-join or different things like that, you know? Um, and it, it will, it'll tell you what index it's acting upon and how it's getting all that data, what the cardinality estimates were. That's where it starts to look at how can I get this data out? And that's why statistics are so important. This is another big bottleneck in relational database systems is what indexes do you have that make the shortest path to get to the data. It will make choices based on the indexes and how fresh those statistics are and how accurate the statistics are for the way you've uh, designed your tables. So um, you might have a situation in which you have a table that has a primary key, but no clustered index. Uh, it's, you know, it's very prone to page splits and things like that. It's very fragmented. Access methods will take into account that I don't have you know, a clustered index to look at. So I'm gonna try to use a non-clustered index now. And then, you know, and then I'll take this kind of hierarchy of choices to get to the actual data. Now, we want to go back to that other touch point earlier of maximizing hardware. And that's where the buffer manager comes in. So again, he gets on his bike, he pedals over from access methods to the buffer manager. And he asks the buffer manager, where is my data? It can really be basically in one of two places. It can either be in the cache already. I've already, you know, somebody else came along and asked for all the airport codes, so that's in the cache. If it's in the cache, once again, just like what we had with the execution plans, we can save ourselves an enormous amount of work because it's right there in memory. But if it's not in the cache, we have to then go to the IO subsystem and retrieve that data and load it into the cache. Now, I do want to point out, too, that there have been times where um, I and I know other experts have said, that's when SQL Server has to go directly to disk. And that's actually a misstatement. We're being inaccurate. Because SQL Server never goes directly to disk. If it is manipulating data in any way, it's actually always doing it in memory. So it grabs it on disk, and then it loads it into memory, and then it does its work there. And then if it has to you know, put that back out, it'll send that back out to disk. So we look to see if the answers to his questions are in cache. If they are, yay, it's, it's done. If not, we have to inquire of it from the data files and load it up into cache. And that's another huge, you know, I do a whole full day session that's kind of about tuning uh, your setup and configuration for SQL Server because how you set up your files and your file groups and what kind of subsystem you put them on, you know, if it's RAID or RAID 5 or RAID 10, uh, SSDs, all of that can make a huge difference, huge difference in the performance of a system. Could be the exact same queries, exact same database design, but just the way you've laid those out on files on your database. Again, area of further study. So if it's in cache or if it has to be loaded from disk to the cache, then it is returned actually kind of a round trip back through the whole system. It's handed back to the buffer manager. Buffer manager says, okay, now I've gotten all the information I need. Um, access methods, let them know. And so it, it pipes it all the way back through and then Sheldon finally gets his answer, right? So that's, that's kind of how a select statement works. Now, another part that I need to tell you about, let me go back. So this is just Sheldon by himself, but what if there's 400 people like Sheldon trying to book travel plans, right? What happens then? As it moves from the protocol layer to the SQL Server engine, there's a component of SQL Server called SQL OS. And older versions of SQL Server, it used to be called UMS, the user, man, uh, user mode scheduler. And with SQL OS, what happens is, again, I'm gonna use an analogy. For each CPU that SQL Server has, could be logical or physical, it could be a hyper-threaded CPU or, or you know, a real core on, on the chip. That is, it's given a scheduler. And you might think of a scheduler as a, kind of like a drive-through window at, a rest, at one of these fast food restaurants. And normally when Sheldon connects to the, the system, he's given a, 
a thread on that scheduler, a SPID, you know, if you look in SPWho or the activity monitor. And so he asked for all the airport codes, and the scheduler gets some time on the CPU, processes his request, and hands him back what he asks for. However, sometimes things go a little bit bad, they don't work out too well, maybe I asked wrong, you know, I didn't phrase my question well, uh, maybe there's something wrong back behind, uh, back behind the, uh, the counter. And so what happens here is, is worth mentioning as well, because this is very important, not just for understanding how SQL Server handles multiple users, but also your first avenue for troubleshooting and performance tuning. As users are assigned to each of the different threads that they're given, and the scheduler can handle lots and lots of threads at one time, um, if you are able to get all the resources you need, you're putting, put in the running queue. You're actually on a CPU, your work is being done. Everyone else who is asking for resources and have what they need are put into a runnable queue. And this is also known, um, at this point, SQL Server, for any worker that's assigned to a thread, begins to accumulate for them wait statistics. Anything that makes you wait to complete your operation is accumulated and put into a category. And you can query the wait statistics DMOS wait stats to see all the different places that SQL Server is waiting to get work done. So what happens is we might have uh, a situation, you know, uh-oh, out of soda at the, uh, at the soda counter, and you know, so they're like, hey, you know, let's, let's go get some more uh, of the stuff we need to make sodas. Same thing happens in SQL Server. You're, so, you're told, we can't make a soda, you're told, I can't give you all the records you need, I can't lock them all, using the acid property of transactions to keep them consistent and isolated and durable. Can't lock them all at one time because somebody else has them. So why don't you go ahead and step out of line for me, and once those other locks are released, I'll let you make that update then. And so that's put, you are then put into a suspended queue, and as you're moved out of the running queue, someone else in the runnable queue gets to step up and get their work done. Everyone in the runnable queue is, in the broadest category, is giving a signal weight. A signal weight tells SQL Server, I've got everything I need, I'm giving you the signal, I've got all the locks on all the records I need, just process me, right? And then the other kind of weight, like I need these extra records to complete my transactions, those are called resource weights. And so you can look in SQL Server just to get a, an idea of the difference between signal weights and resource weights. And then you can take it further and you could say, well, how many people are waiting for compile time on CPU? How many people are, you know, if the lock is an LCK underscore sort of lock, that's, I'm sorry, a sort of weight, then that means it's a lock related weight. If it's CX packet weights, then that means it's related to parallelism. So this will tell you by looking at the DMOS wait stats, what are your main problem areas inside a SQL Server? Now, one other thing to dive into a little bit deeper uh, when looking at the big picture from earlier is those caches. Again, memory is so much faster than any other uh, method that we might have to access uh, SQL Server plans, data, and different things like that. So what, what happens inside of those caches? How long does a cache stay, uh, a page stay in those different caches? Does anyone know what the kind of algorithm is that is used to keep data or uh, execution plan in cache? First in, first out? First in, first out? LRU. LRU. I was trying to think if that actually works, first in, first out. LRU. So um, LRU means least recently used. If you're uh, an algorithm aficionado, it's the LRU-K algorithm. And you can look it up at SIGMOD or ACM. Um, what happens is, uh, and this is controlled by a very important process in the, in the background, that runs in the background of SQL Server called Lazy Writer. And I actually usually ask potential DBAs when I'm interviewing them, you know, tell me about what Lazy Writer does. This is one of those internal things, just like in the racing scenario, you know, what does a spark plug do? It's internal, but it's very, very important. And for me, when I think about Lazy Writer, I always mentally visualize this, this old 70s movie, 60s movie with Jack Nicholson and Peter Fonda on big Harleys riding around America, smoking marijuana and stuff like that. Um, 
And the, but that one's called Easy Rider. So don't tell someone, the, it's the Easy Rider that's doing that. I've done that mistake. <laughs> so what, what happens in there? LRU, least recently used. Okay, remember, go back to that other, um, that other diagram we had a minute ago. How big of a deal was that query optimizer compared to, say, the, the network protocol? You know, the network protocol was like a little kiosk, you know, where you're waiting for the bus, right? Just go right through it. The query optimizer is like the 72-story building. So when we talk about execution plans, for example, here's what happens. We, we execute a stored procedure called get order. SQL Server creates two counters for get order. The first one is the complexity value. That's the one on the left. And on the right-hand side is the complexity counter that counts down. About every minute or so, or whenever a thread requests it, the lazy writer, in this case I'm just using Sheldon, the lazy writer wakes up and takes a look at everything in the cache. And uh, you, know, you can see in the cache that there are some things that are really not complex at all. SP4, SP1, you know, they just have values of two or three. And notice that everything gets decremented by one. So now SP4 has a value of one on the counter side, but the complexity value is still set to two. The complexity value doesn't change. Uh, the lazy writer goes away. He comes back um, about a minute later, takes another look around at all these different um, values, the different complexity um, counters. And if those have not been used by another individual, remember I said it's going to take a look to see if that execution plan exists in the cache? If it does exist in the cache, it doesn't have to use it again. It doesn't have to create a new one. But if it doesn't exist in the cache, it creates a new one, loads it up in there like it did for get order just a moment ago. Some of these, over time, get decremented down to zero, like SP4 over there in the corner. What, what do you think SQL Server will do when the lazy writer comes back and it finds one of these stored procedures or triggers or views or select statements, any of that kind of stuff, and it's hit zero. What will SQL Server do? The, the, the most accurate answer to any technology problem is it depends, right? Uh, <laughs> so in this case, what SQL Server will do is if there is memory pressure and it's been marked at zero, it will get rid of it. But if there's not memory pressure, SQL Server will say, I right, just leave it in there just in case somebody needs that, right? Because I have plenty of memory. And that's actually called a ghosted record. It's not yet deleted, it's been ghosted. And so there is something you'll see. If you look at the SPIDs from 50 downward, you'll see that there are SPIDs in there that say, say things like uh, broker cleanup task, and then there'll be one that's a ghost cleanup. That's what takes care of any of these that have hit zero that are needed to be dismissed so that we can make room in memory. So if there's plenty of room in memory, we'll keep it. But if there's not, there's memory pressure, we'll get rid of it. And if anyone comes along and executes one of these, like find user, somebody else comes along and reuses that execution plan, we re-establish that number. We re-assert it back up to its complexity value. So the idea that we're, uh, that we're doing with our code here is that the harder it is to, to compile, the longer we want it to remain in the cache. The easier it is to compile, the less we care about the fact that we have to recompile it and build a whole new plan for it. So the really easy stuff gets to stick around for a long time, or for a short period of time, because it's easy to recreate, but the really complex stuff gets to stay in a lot, lot longer. By the way, how, um, how realistic or useful are those complexity value numbers when you look at them? If you were to look at that number and pull it up in the internals and look at it, what would it mean just when you look at that number? Actually, it wouldn't mean much of anything because it's, it's internal to, to the SQL Server, um, that operation. It doesn't actually correlate to like milliseconds of time. It doesn't have any correlation to anything except how complex this particular piece of code is relative to all the others out there. 
Now, another question that people have asked me is, uh, what about the buffer cache? So this is, you know, the plan cache is one part of the cache. The buffer cache is another. How different is it with the buffer cache? Um, the short answer to how different is it is um, both very little and enormous huge amount differently. So it's either not different at all or it's almost entirely different. Uh, so what, what am I saying actually? What I'm saying is um, in generalities, it works very similar. Uh, you know, the older it is, the less frequently it's been used, the less uh, likely it is to stay in cash. Those kind of rules are all the same. However, there are like thousands of little, I'm exaggerating, there are hundreds of little asterisks at the end of that saying, well, if the table is between five and 10 gigabytes, then it's gonna be stored, uh, this proportion will be stored for this period of time based on how much memory pressure, and if it's between you know, 5.1 and, or you know, 10.1 and 20 gigabytes in size and all the other, you know, so there's all kinds of if this, then this, else this sorts of things for how the buffer cache is managed. So in generalities, it's the same, but in the specifics, it is quite different because there's all kinds of um, alternatives based on how much memory pressure is happening on the buffer cache. Is that kind of understandable? Seem to make some sense? Yeah, for, so one real co a well-known um, kind of um, option in the buffer cache is that if your table is 64K or less, so you have a small table, it's 64K or less, it'll always do a table scan and load the whole table in, just because that's, that's the easiest way for SQL Server to grab all that data in a full extent at one time. It just throws it all in there. Um, whereas if it's a really big table, it starts to get more and more smart about how it keeps all of that data uh, resident in the cache. All right, so we talked about reads. We talked about how the cache works. We talked about how the SQL OS component works. Let's talk about writes now, okay? Same layout that we had before, and things work pretty much the same way. So, uh, you know, Sheldon is now gonna actually start to book his ticket to a city. He's gone through all the checks. He's gonna do an insert, an update, a delete statement, maybe a merge. Uh, that's also a DML statement. Also, incidentally, Things like grants and drops, those are also write operations. It's just that those are write operations to the system tables that give you permission to different uh, things. The uh, create table, drop table, uh, create stored procedure, drop stored procedure, those are all write operations as well. It's just that they don't write to user tables, they write to system tables. And so they produce the same kind of locks, same kind of activity here. So, sequel, uh, so Sheldon sits down, now he's gonna book his trip to uh, uh, Brussels or Antwerp, wherever he's going, uh, takes it and puts it into TDS packets, which are then stuffed into uh, TCP IP packets, handed, uh, you know, sent across the wire to SQL Server, it catches it by default on port 1433, hands it off to the parser, and the parser says, do I recognize this? Is this a language element or not? If it is, then it checks to see if it exists in the, um, in the plan cache, if I've already got it in the plan cache again, I can save myself a lot of time and trouble. If it doesn't exist, then I need to build it, right? So I'm gonna take and hand over a query tree to the optimizer. And again, we go through that four phase process. We're gonna produce from that the query plan. Now, one thing that is interesting to note is like when I started my career, um, I actually started writing a lot of reports and doing things like that and writing a lot of select statements. I was really good at it and enjoyed it. And then I was asked to start writing the data modification kinds of work, like a insert and update and delete statements. So like the first time I wrote a delete statement or perhaps when you write a delete statement, hopefully you're first doing a select statement, right? To make sure you're gonna get just the data that needs to be deleted and no more, no less. Does, does that sound familiar? Yes, okay, thank you, I'm reassured. In one session, I, I was uh, giving this lecture and one guy said, no, I just use rollback if it's not right. And I thought, I don't wanna work where you work. <laughs> yeah, I'll just undo it if I make a mistake. Woo, <laughs> okay then. Yeah, so normally if I'm writing, a, if I'm gonna write some delete or updates or something like that, I'm gonna write a select statement first to make sure that I get the right data, you know? One of the things that was really surprising to me is that when I looked at the execution plan for the select statement, it was a small, tight execution plan. It wasn't anything very scary. But then when I looked at the update statement, it was huge. 
It spanned page after page after page. Why would that be? Why would an update or a delete be so much, or an insert, be so much more complex than a select statement? It has to check all the indexes. Yeah? Keys. Triggers. Thank you. So if it has triggers, it also has to build into the, you know, if there's an update trigger on that table, it has to build all of the trigger logic into the execution plan. Absolutely. And the, the, so I expected that when I was writing at that time. What I didn't expect was the impact of keys. So what is, what is a um, primary key? It uniquely identifies each row, right? And what is a unique key? It also can uniquely identify each row. How do we tell if a value is unique? We have to do a select against all the values in there to make sure that it's not colliding with a pre-existing value. So now we have to build in the execution plan for that select statement. So if you have a primary key on these three columns and a unique key on another column, now we have two new select statements that go into that execution plan. And what if there are foreign keys? Foreign keys say that we have to make sure that there's a value in another table. So maybe we're doing an insert or an update to the sales order detail table, and we have to make sure that there exists a sales order header record. So now we have to do a select against that table too. And that execution plan will be included in the uh, execution plan of your DML statement. So your DML operations, your write operations, tend to have much more complex execution plans because they have to take into account triggers, keys, and all of those other things, check constraints, stuff like that. I once, uh, back, back in the day when I was, uh, uh, Mark Souza, who is a Microsoft person who is here, um, uh, it was the SQL 6.0 or, gosh, way long time ago. He, he kind of called me over and said, hey, Kevin, I want you to take a look at this. Uh, not in the sense that he wanted me to give advice or anything like that, in the sense that one friend might ask another to come to the window of the, the tall building they work in so they can both see the car wreck out in the street, right? And uh, it's like, what is it? He had a customer um, who had execution plans for their various um, reports and things like that that would run into the 30 megabytes of size, a single execution plan. And if you ever wondered what a 30 megabyte execution plan does to the plan cache, think of a car wreck. <laughs> it's a horrible, horrible thing. Um, and uh, I'll tell you the full story about how they resolve that uh, later on, but that was really quite an interesting uh, experience. So we're gonna see if it exists in the plan cache. If it doesn't exist, we have to build it. We use the query executor to hand it off to the access methods, just like before, except things get a lot different now, okay? This box was whited out earlier. All those acid property of transactions now put an enormous amount of overhead on SQL Server. If we could turn these things off, and some people try to with hints, we could get a lot faster. But then we introduce a lot of risk into the system. Two main areas in the transaction manager are invoked at this point. The first is the log manager, because in SQL Server, nothing gets done that's a right operation unless it is first written to the transaction log. And it will be written, again, using a hash algorithm. It's not human eye readable, but there are some tools that you can purchase and there are some, uh, there are some um, uh, commands you can use, transact SQL commands you can use to actually read the transactions that are in the transaction log. So that's the first thing that happens. It has to be written to the transaction log. Tons and tons of advice about how to make your transaction log go faster because if the transaction log stops wor working, if it fills up and doesn't have any more room to grow, no transactions can be written. It's all done, right? So it has to go there first. The transaction log, it's interesting. The transaction is written first and nothing has been changed in the database. In fact, we have to then go on and take all the steps to lock the transactions that we need, uh, the records that we need to or the pages of the tables. And then we invoke the buffer manager. So uh, we inquire from the buffer manager, where is all this data that I need? Does it exist? Just like we did with the execution plans for the select statement, we're gonna say, okay, does this data exist in the cache already? Have I already loaded this up in cache? If I have it in the cache, I don't have to inquire it from the IO subsystem. If it exists in the cache, I'll go ahead and make those changes right there on those 8K data pages that are loaded up into the cache. Does that mean it has been written out to the data files yet? 
No. So uh, what is the name of a data page that has been changed, but it hasn't actually been written to disk yet? Yes. It is a dirty page. It's a very dirty page. Dirty, dirty page. Uh, yes, you dirty page. And that's all it is. It's different up there than it is to disk. And that's one of the reasons why people will say, not always a good idea to use that no-lock hint. You know, a lot of times we're thinking, oh, hey, we're going to be a lot faster with the no-lock hint. Well, you're also going to expose yourself to risk because you're looking at things that have not been made fully permanent in the database there. It might be changed later on. So there's another process. So the lazy writer is the process that cleans up the, um, cleans up the plan cache. There's another process, and you can see the name of it there, called the checkpoint. Checkpoint is responsible for keeping the data cache cleaned up. Okay? And again, it's going to run by default in SQL Server based on a setting in SP options, uh, S, uh, the, um, the configuration settings called recovery interval. Okay? So you can change it yourself. You could go in and you could say, I don't want the checkpoint to run by default at every minute. I want it to run every five minutes. So you change that recovery interval setting from one to five, and it would only run once every five minutes. Or you can, you know, you could... Uh, Type it in. It's an ANSI SQL command. You could type in checkpoint at the Management Studio interface, and it will actually flush all of those dirty pages out to disk right then. In fact, a friend of mine who's uh, now a member of uh, SQL CAT, the customer advisory team, he worked at the United States' biggest printer. Uh, they printed all of the glossy magazines, you know, like uh, Vanity Fair and uh, Vogue and all, all of those kind of magazines. And um, they put in a whole new mechanized system back in the early 2000s that was built on SQL Server. And by the way, if you ever buy a product and the salespeople say to you, you are our biggest customer, we're so excited, don't buy that product because <laughs> it's not going to work right. If they sell to a, you know, a, a different size company than yours and you're the one who, you're biggest by far, things are going to be rocky. And that's, that was their experience. The, the system would print on rolls of paper that were taller than Chuck. And Chuck is taller than me by several inches, uh, several centimeters, I should say. He couldn't touch the top of that roll of paper. It was huge, huge roll of paper. And it was a very, very long print line. And between the amount of time it took for an operator to see that paper was starting to turn sideways and maybe get messed up, to walk to the end of the print line and press stop, it would actually have printed through a whole roll of that paper, right? Huge, huge high-speed system. And at each step along the way, it wrote records back to SQL Server. And the, when they turned it on for the first time and started to run, SQL Server hit that one-minute mark. Ah, wow, that's a lot of transactions. Whew, whew, hard work. And then the next load came through at the two-minute mark, and SQL Server said, whoa, whoa, I can't keep my eyes above the water. And then by three minutes, it was like, oh, I'm dead. You know, X is for eyes. It's all over, right? They're like, wow, what is going on? Well, they found out that the checkpoint was just throwing, it was just set to default, and it was just throwing too many transactions at the configuration they had. And so they went in, I figured out, we change these rolls of paper all the time, you know, every five minutes or so. So let's just manually type in checkpoint We'll, turn, we'll set it to the maximum, 120 minutes, and we'll manually issue checkpoints ourselves whenever we change a roll of paper. It worked fine. Went as fast as this subsystem could go. Didn't have any of those buffering issues. So you can control that, right? But once it finds the data that it needs, it makes the changes on those AK data pages and uh, then flushes them to disk, then it's essentially considered fully written to the database system. If it's not, if it hasn't been flushed by the checkpoint, and SQL Server experiences a massive failure. What happens to those transactions? Are they lost? I was hoping for a resounding no. It's like, then I know you were like not asleep. Um, no, right? Acid properties of transactions. When you start up your database the next time, if it fails, it'll tell you, hey, I'm applying all those transactions because they were written to the transaction log already. They weren't written to the database, so I'm going to roll forward the 32 transactions that, I, that were close enough to being finished. They were fully isolated and consistent and durable. I'm going to roll all those forward, and there were 17 that weren't quite ready to go, so I'm going to roll all of those back. So it would keep everything in tip-top shape that way. All right. 
So that's pretty much the architecture, the major components inside of the system. Now we could go deeper and deeper and deeper if you want to spend another day talking about it. So love to do that with you as well. Like what is, what is in the buffer cache? What is in the data files? You know, what, is, what are these structures called IAMs and GAMs and SGAMs and all that sort of stuff? So we could talk about all those other things, but for most of us, we don't really need to know all of that, but it's extremely important to understand just like those pit crews, we need to know how that engine works. You know, what are the major components? What do they do? And how do they work? So let's, let's kind of review that as we wrap it up here. All right. So, A. Atomic, thank you, some of you were awake. C. Consistent, yes. I. Isolated, and D. Durable, very good. All right, how about the, the relational engine, which I had at the top? What are the three main components in the relational engine? Command Sorry? Command parser. Command parser, yes. The query optimizer, the big one, yeah. And the morbid one with the battle axe, right? <laughs> the executor, right. And then in the storage engine, again, pretty much three main components. Buffer manager. Transaction manager, access. access methods, very good. And then uh, the cache, we had two main areas, two main areas, but lots of little ones. Data and plan, right? Couldn't be simpler. Uh, then the transaction manager had two small areas in it, or two areas in it as well. Sounds kind of like uh, you're at a rock and roll, lock it out, lock it out. So, okay. Uh, <laughs> all right, those were the, Lock manager and log manager, right, all right. You knew that, you were just wanting me to make an even bigger fool of myself, weren't you? You're a sadist, I just realized it. All right, and what are those two processes that control how things are um, written into cache and flushed out of cache? What are those two processes called? Lazy writer. Lazy writer and checkpoint, very good, all right. So some of you were outspoken enough to save the rest of you, you passed the test, very good, all right. We have a, a couple minutes for uh, a few questions. Anyone uh, care to ask uh, any questions? Wow. Yes. Our transaction log records placed into the buffer, and actually, it goes straight in. It doesn't. It doesn't spend time going up in a memory and then back. It goes straight. There's a. There's a. Uh, a special transaction log manager, and there are some um, features in SQL Server that can access the transaction logs as they're written to, to the disk, su whatever subsystem you've declared that it goes to. Um, for example, if you use transactional replication, uh, change data capture, I think um, it's possible auditing also looks at that. So anytime those, they're, they're kind of sent through a pipe, I guess you could say, they're, it's very, very, specially designed to go very quickly to that subsystem, wherever it is. It doesn't first go up into some area of the buffer cache or anything like that. Yeah, good, good question. Yes, what else? Yes, in the back. Uh -huh. Is there a difference in the different protocols for SQL Server, TCP, IP, name pipes, and that sort of thing? There are differences, definitely. Um, there are a couple new, newish protocols, shared memory and VDI, which are much more high speed. And the intention for, I can't remember which of the two, I think it might be, well, one of those two is, was specifically designed for an operator who's actually physically connected, standing next to the machine so that it's much, much faster. So maybe if you're remediating a problem and trying to fix something uh, that's horribly broken, you could use that protocol rather than TCP IP because you know, then it has to be put into the packets and sent out and so forth. So that's kind of the idea is I'm inside or right next to the machine. So I want to do it all in that same workspace. I'm not you know, 300 miles away from the data center, something like that. Yes, a, qu a question here. It's about the plan cache. Yes. And uh, the question is, uh, it's, you said it was the least recently used uh, plans that were, 
or marked for being thrown out. And also the complexity of the question. Right. So the more complex the question, uh, the, the, the less uh, probability to be thrown out. Right. Or mm -hmm. marked or but I didn't quite understand. But maybe I'm, I'm not. Intelligent enough, but the relation between uh, uh, how old it was and how complex it was. Right. I, I guess you explained it there, but it's just. Right. Uh, okay, well, to restate, um, SQL Server wants to, the question was, you know, how, how does that work? And so what happens is, I guess you could say the, the more complex, the longer it is, the more time it took to compile that particular code and load it into the execution plan, the bigger it is the higher the complexity number is, okay? And based on that complexity number, is, it's kind of given a lifespan. And if it, it gets used at any point before it expires, that lifespan expires, that number gets reset. And so if it's a very short query that says, select employee ID from the employee table, where name equals such and such, that has a number 10, let's say. If after 10 seconds, Nobody else uses it, it's gone. But, you know, the end of year reports for the financial office has a complexity value of 300,000. So we're going to let that stay for a long, long time uh, before it gets aged out of the cache. So it, it's kind of, that indicator is the lifespan of that particular execution plan. And if anyone uses it before its lifespan has expired, it gets renewed yeah. and, and stays in a little bit longer than that. Thank you. Does that make sense? Uh, time for one more. One last question. Yes. Where comes the judgment of using memory or TempDB? Where comes the judgment of using memory versus TempDB? Well, of course, much of the time we specifically ask to use TempDB because we've used a hash mark or, you know, pound, pound. So we've declared a temporary table. The other thing, too, is in the, uh, when we're at the access methods point, SQL Server will look at what you have asked it to do and it makes all kinds of decisions about whether it needs to create temporary work tables, okay? So for example, if you ever have a, a SQL select statement that has a group by, there's probably a 60 or 70% chance that it's going to create a temp table in tempdb. If you have a group by statement that has a having clause, 100% of the time, it will create a temporary table in tempdb to sort out that result set. So actually, if you spend a little time and learn uh, the, what all of the different um, steps mean in an execution plan, you can look at your execution plans and know instantly that this query is creating temporary work tables. If you ever see a sort, um, a sort operation, a spool operation, a hash join, or a merge join, almost always will you be having uh, temp tables created. So SQL Server will usually choose that at the access method step, based on the work you're asking it to do in the query. You can also use a couple perfmon counters to see what is happening. Um, you can see how many uh, objects are being created per second in tempdb. And then also you can look at, um, there are specific uh, perfmon counters for the access methods, um, the, the whole category of access methods. So you could see how many sort operations are being done, how many, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of what else. So there are metrics that let you see specifically as time goes on what's happening. But if you were to look, be looking at an individual query, it would be at the access methods point and based on the query execution plan, whether it chose to create a temporary table or not. Yeah, very good question. Anything else? Uh, yes, one last one. Ah, yes, great question. So with the transaction log, what's different about the, um, with the transaction log, what's different about the different recovery models that you can use, right? And I was actually hoping someone would ask this question, so you get the gold star. A lot of people think that because I've set my database to simple recovery mode, I'm not really doing anything with the transaction log. And in fact, that is not true at all. Everything still has to go through the transaction log because this is a relational database. We are governed by the ACID properties of transactions. All that simple recovery mode does for you is it tells SQL Server, every time I do a checkpoint, 
truncate the transaction log and clear it all out. So if you're in bulk load or in full recovery mode, SQL Server allows that transaction log to grow larger and larger so that you can recover to a specific point in time. When you make the conscious decision, I want to use simple recovery mode, what you're basically saying is, I don't have really rigorous recovery needs, so I can just you know, recover to last night's backup or something like that. But that doesn't mean the uh, transaction log isn't being used and shouldn't be tuned, just like I was saying earlier. It will be used, it needs to be tuned. The only difference is it's being truncated by default. Again, if you change that recovery interval setting in SP Configure, it could be a different number, but by default, every minute, it's just being cleared out. Minute passes, let's wipe it all out, minute passes. But it is accumulating in there, and there are times when it's possible that a transaction gets kind of stuck in its throat, if you will. It doesn't finish, but it, uh, you know, it doesn't resolve, but it has started that transaction. And so when that happens, the transaction log cannot clear out past the last oldest open transaction. So if you have open transactions and you're in simple recovery mode, it's still possible to have a transaction log that will fill up your disk drive and make your SQL Server crash because the transaction got stuck and wouldn't complete. So great question. All of the infrastructure is still the same, but when you set it to simple recovery mode, it simply says try to keep that as clear as you can as we go along. Good question. All right, folks, we're all out of time. I hope this was informative. Thanks very much. Hope to see you soon. <laughs>